a man and a woman arrive by elevator to a strange location. They are confused and disoriented, wondering what this place they arrived at is and revealing that they are called Takashi and Machiko, a married couple. Looking around, they quickly find their way to a bar, where a strange man with white hair greets them and welcomes them to Quindesim, introducing himself as Desim. He questions them if they remember anything about their way to this place, to which both of them confirm that their memories are quite jumbled, and they do not recall how or why they are here. Hearing that, Desim thanks them and lays out the rules of this place to them. He explains to them how he cannot tell them where they are, but they will have to play a game, which will be decided at random, and which they will need to stake their lives on. Takashi is reasonably upset and tries to find a way out of the bar, but quickly realizes that there is no such thing. Desim tells him that they will not be able to leave the bar until they finish the game. Takashi starts arguing, but Desim puts an end to that quickly by showing him a hidden room behind the bar, in which countless bodies seem to be hanging from the ceiling. However, it is too dark to see them clearly. Frightened by the sight, the couple decides to go along with the game for the time being. Desim presents them the button which will randomly choose their game, and after Takashi presses it, it ends up selecting a game of darts. At that moment one of the walls of the bar disappears and a new room designed specifically for that game appears. Desim leads them inside and explains the rules of the darts game. At first the rules seem to be exactly the same as in a normal game, but the twist comes at the end, as he adds how they will inflict pain to each other depending on the location they hit on the dartboard, and how much points they score. Takashi is convinced that this is a bluff and starts the game, but as soon as they throw their first darts, he learns that it is exactly as Desim told them. Scared and upset, he confronts Desim again, who reminds him that their lives are on the line in this game, but also tells him that they can avoid pain if they just miss all of their remaining throws. Realizing that missing is an option, the couple starts tossing away their darts, hitting outside of the scoring area. At first it goes well, but suddenly Takashi realizes that he will be the one losing if their scores remain unchanged. Scared of ending up like the hanging bodies in the dark room from before, he suddenly changes his mind and hits the scoreboard. Vachiko believes that it was just a slip of the wrist and tries to miss her throw, but the pain he inflicted onto her causes her to lose control and score a hit instead. As they are running out of darts and hurting each other, their memories start to return. Nachiko apologizes for hurting him with her last throw and begs of him to be kind and avoid inflicting pain to her stomach area, as she reveals that she is pregnant with his child. Hearing that, Takashi quickly calms down, but just as he is about to throw his dart away, another memory flows back. This makes him change the trajectory and hit exactly the place he had to in order to hurt Machiko's abdomen. She wonders why he did that, and he reveals that he overheard her friends talking about her affair. He tells her that he loved her so much that he could not bring himself to cancel the wedding, despite knowing that she is only after his money. Machiko tries to explain that he is wrong and that she truly loves him, but he does not listen. Just as he is about to throw the last dart, Machiko realizes that he confused who they were talking about with another friend of hers due to her nickname, so she tells him all about it. This catches Takashi off guard and he is left confused. In order to prove how much she loves him, she snatches away the final dart from him and tries to toss it at his board instead. But Takashi pulls her to the side, changing the trajectory of the throw, and causing it to hit the bullseye on her side instead. This inflicts severe pain upon him and makes her win the game, which causes all of the memories to return to her. She remembers how she fell in love with Takashi, got pregnant and decided to get married with him, and how they went on a honeymoon together. And it was during this honeymoon that they had a fatal car crash. Takashi demands a rematch, but suddenly stops when Machiko states how it does not matter, as they are already dead. Desim confirms that, telling them that they arrived here because they died at the same time, explaining how Quindesim exists to pass judgment on souls and send them to either heaven or hell. This forces Takashi to remember everything as well, and he realizes that they died due to a car crash which he caused, only because he was suspecting her of having an affair. Learning that he is responsible not only for their own deaths, but for the death of their unborn child as well, proves to be too much for him and he has a mental breakdown. First he begs Desim to save them, but Desim states how that is impossible, as he is only an arbiter. Hearing that, he shifts his anger back at Machiko, insisting how the child was never his, as she must have had an affair after all. Machiko cannot stand seeing Takashi like that, so she ends up declaring how he is correct, adding that she never loved him in the first place and it was all an act from the beginning. 
This makes Takashi act up in anger and he charges at her, but Desim steps in, restraining him with his unique ability to control strings. Seeing that Takashi will not calm down, he knocks him out completely, before declaring how the game has been concluded and they need to return to the elevator. Placing Takashi in one elevator, while Machiko ends up in the other, he bids both of them farewell before sending them away. As soon as they are gone, two girls show up. The taller, dark-haired one states how this was awful and wonders where their souls ended up going. The smaller, white-haired girl explains how Takashi was sent to be reincarnated, while Machiko was thrown into the void, hearing that makes the taller girl question Desim. Earlier that day, the same black-haired girl wakes up being greeted by the white-haired one. The white-haired one introduces herself as Nane, while the black-haired one is unable to remember who she is. Nana reassures her that everything is alright, and that she does in fact not have a name. She takes the black-haired girl to the elevator, where the elevator's operator, Clavis, greets them. Following Nana's orders, he brings them to Quindesim. They meet up with Desim, who welcomes them and introduces himself to the black-haired girl. Nana quickly explains how there will be two guests coming along shortly, and they will make them play a game with their lives at stake, as it is their duty as arbiters to pass judgment upon them, based on their memories from when they were alive, as well as the extent of humanity they display during their game. The black-haired girl is surprised by all of that, so Nana continues the lecture. Contacting Quinn, she tells her to send the memories of the incoming deceased pair to Desim, while she leads the black-haired girl into the dark back room. On the way there, the girl wonders just what her purpose here is, to which Nana elaborates that she is to be an assistant. Arriving at the back room, the assistant is shocked to see all the hanging dummy parts, but Nana reassures her that there is no reason to be alarmed as putting them together is Desim's hobby. From the dark room they observe the couple that enters the bar, Takashi and Machiko. While Nana keeps telling the assistant how arbiters must make the deceased believe that they are playing a game with their life on stake, in order to push them to the extreme and draw out the darkness in their hearts. This is a must, as they are unable to judge them with memories alone, so they must see how they confront their own darkness before they can pass judgment. That is why they wipe the memories of their death from them only returning it bit by bit as the game nears its conclusion, as no one would participate in the game if they already knew they were dead. The assistant finds that to be quite unpleasant, but does not voice any objections. From the sidelines Nana and the assistant continue observing the game of darts that Takashi and Machiko are playing, watching them as they reveal more about their nature as the game draws ever closer to the end. Once the game concludes and Desim sends Takashi and Machiko away in the elevator, Nana and the assistant meet up with him post-haste. Even though the assistant finds this to be awful, Nana reassures her that she will get used to it in no time. After confirming that he sent Takashi to be reincarnated, while condemning Machiko to the void, the assistant wonders why he did that, as it was clear that she loved him. Desim and Nana state how Machiko had indeed a memory of being with another man. However, the assistant insists, that it must have been a one-off thing in the past, which she probably regrets. She adds that Machiko was so fond of Takashi that she condemned herself willingly, just to spare him the knowledge of killing his own unborn child. Taking the assistant's point of view into account, Desim admits that he might have made a mistake in passing judgment this time. Nana is quick to reprimand him and remind him that he has to do a better job analyzing human emotions. Afterwards Nana tells the assistant that her job is to stay here with Desim and provide her insight for the time being, before taking her leave. Once Nana leaves, Desim once again apologizes for his bad judgment, stating that he holds great respect for humans who have lived full lives. A young man is woken up by Desim inside Quindesim. Already sitting against the bar is a young woman. And as soon as the man joins her, Desim welcomes both of them to Quindesim, starting the explanation of their situation and the rules of the death game that lies in store for them. This time the assistant is there to help him with the explanation as well, although she merely takes a background role, and lets Desim do most of the talking. They refuse to play a game at first, starting to get to know each other as they try to find a way out. The young man's name is Shaidru, but the girl's memories are not as clear, and she is unable to remember who she is. Bringing that up with Desim, he tells them that she is probably going to remember all about herself if they play the game. Even though they are not satisfied with Desim's sketchy explanation, they accept to participate in the game. This time the game ends up being bowling. The twist on the game is that the bowling balls are linked to their hearts, and they will bowl with each other's hearts. Shocked by this, they become reluctant to play, but Desim reassures them that apart from being linked to the heart, there are no other effects and neither of them will feel any pain or discomfort. The game starts off, and unlike the previous pair, the two of them are having fun playing the game. 
With the game coming along, some of their memories start returning and they both remember how they were saying farewells to each other as children. This makes both of them realize that she is none other than Chisato, his childhood friend and crush, who moved away to the city. He is quick to step up and asks her to go out on a date with him if he manages to win. Chisato is not sure why that is making her so happy, but she quickly accepts the wager. Overjoyed that she finally remembers who she is, Chisato happily plays along and they are getting close to the final round. As Shaiju rolls his final ball, all of the memories flood back and he remembers how he met Chisato again in the bowling alley he went to with his friends. He quickly developed a crush on her once more and his friends told him what they knew about her. They happened to share the same bus ride home, and it was then when he mustered his courage to approach her and ask her out. However, he did not get a chance to say much, as at that moment the bus got hit by a truck and they both died. Suddenly remembering everything leaves him paralyzed with shock. But to not ruin the mood, he suppresses that feeling and pretends that nothing is wrong in front of Chisato. In order to make sure she loses and ends up getting a date with Shaidru, Chisato decides to miss with her final ball. Just as she throws it in the gutter, all of her memories return as well. It is then that it is revealed how she is in fact not Chisato, as she remembers that she is called Mai. She was always by Shaidru's side since their childhood. But she was not very pretty, and despite Chisato moving away and leaving the two of them behind, she never managed to catch his eye. Because of that she decided to undergo plastic surgery and make herself more attractive. Before she can say anything, Shaidru speaks up, asking Desim if they are already dead. Desim confirms his suspicion and is about to explain everything to them when Shaidru interrupts him. He states how he understands everything and does not need any further explanation. Instead he approaches Mai and asks her if she will go out with him now that he has won. Caught off guard, Mai tries to tell him about the misunderstanding, but he quickly stops her, telling her how he knows everything. Hearing that, she is happy to accept, so Shaidru asks Desim if they could have their date here in Quindesim. Desim allows for them to enjoy their final moments together and the two have a lovely date. With the date coming to an end, they are brought before the elevator where they say their final farewells to each other. With flashbacks of their memories, it is revealed that Shaidru learned that she was in fact his childhood friend Mai from his other friends, as they told him how she underwent plastic surgery after leaving school, so he did indeed know everything. Both of them are sent away to be reincarnated and the assistant cannot help but be happy with how things turned out for their souls. A middle-aged woman and a man find themselves in Quindesim. They are trying to find a way out to no avail. It is then that the woman comes to a realization and pulls the man away to a private corner in the bathroom. She introduces herself as Misaki, a somewhat famous actress, and tells the man that this must all be a hidden camera TV show. So to make sure it turns out well, she decides to take the lead and have them participate in the game. Desim explains the rules to them and this time around it turns out to be an arcade fighting game. The twist comes when they realize that the only character they can select is their own self, with the character fighting moves being named after personal or embarrassing references to their lives. Thanks to that it is revealed that the man's name is Yasuk. Thinking nothing of it, they start the game and the first round is a quick and resounding victory for Yasuk who seems to be quite skilled at such games. With Misaki losing, some of her memories start coming back and she remembers how she made bad choices in high school, resulting in her getting pregnant, then forced into a marriage, in which her husband abused her. This led her down to a spiral and she ended up having five children, with all of her partners abusing her, forcing her to look after all of them on her own. Before the second round starts, Misaki tells Yasuk to let her win just to make sure it is more exciting for the audience. As the second round starts, Desim pulls out a strange device. The assistant wonders what it is, but all he says about it is that it serves to create a crisis situation for those playing the game. Yasuk follows the plan along at first, but as he is about to lose, he starts fighting back, easily getting back into the game. At that moment Desim uses the device, which sabotages Yasuk's controller, causing him to lose the round. With that his memories start flooding back as well, making him remember how his mother abandoned him and her husband, wishing that he was never born. After some time his father remarried, but he never opened up to his new mother. With the arcade machine sabotaged, Yasuk and Misaki get a break to allow Desim to fix it. During the break, Yasuk brings up the fact that this cannot be a TV show, as the last thing he remembers was him being in his room at home. Thinking this is strange, Misaki confronts Desim and questions him about hidden cameras. When he confirms that they are indeed not being filmed, and that he cannot reveal what will happen after the game, Misaki concludes that the loser will be killed for real. 
The final round starts and she becomes desperate to win so she can return to her children. Giving it her all, she manages to pull off a move that brings her close to winning. But at that point Desim triggers the sabotage again. This time it is Misaki who gets sabotaged. The assistant protests that he is being too cruel, but Desim remains stoic, stating how it was necessary to draw out the darkness. Their argument is interrupted by slamming sounds, as Misaki has gotten out of her seat and has began slamming Yasuke's face into the arcade machine. In her fit of rage, the assistant breaks the device, declaring how it is only forcing people to act that way. Misaki regains her senses and begs of Desim and the assistant to call for an ambulance for Yasuke, shocked and disgusted by what she did to him. But Desim refuses, telling her to continue playing the game. Misaki brands the two of them lunatics and returns to finish the game, completely dejected. Before she can deliver the final blow, Yasuke regains his senses, remembering how warm his new mother was towards him, and he overheard that her only wish is for him to finally call her mom. Jumping back to his controls, he fights back and both of them manage to knock each other out at the same time, resulting in a draw and ending the game. At that moment their memories of death return. Misaki remembers how her assistant killed her after she lashed out at her in her office. On the other hand Yasuke remembers how he got overwhelmed by depression and jumped out of the window, taking his own life. Desim confirms with them that they are both already dead and their souls are here for judgment. Hearing that, Misaki lashes out at him and he is forced to restrain her. She tells him how he has no right to judge her, as she has been through a lot in her life and has finally managed to get everything in order. Yasuke starts crying, wondering what came over him that he decided to take his own life. Misaki starts begging to be sent back, declaring that she will do anything as long as she can return to her children. But Desim is unable to grant such wishes, so all he does is comfort them, telling them they worked hard and did great, before bringing them back to the elevator. Yasuke seems to be sent towards reincarnation, while Misaki is thrown into the void. The assistant wakes up from having a strange, nostalgic dream, but she cannot make any sense of it. Arriving at Quindesim she is surprised to see Desim put up a different roulette board, one resembling a character she dreamed about. Upon inquiring about it, she learns that it was Nana who ordered that to be done. Before they can talk about it more, two new souls arrive at the bar, a middle-aged man and a young boy. Desim states that something is strange about them, but continues to do the usual routine. Meanwhile, Nane is playing pool with an elderly man, who is none other than Oculus, the one who is closest to becoming a god. In the bar, the man suddenly remembers being in this place before and panics. He takes the boy as hostage and starts demanding to be allowed to leave. Oculus and Nana chat about the never-ending duty of Arbiters during their match. Eventually Nana brings the game to an end with yet another victory. Oculus requests a rematch, wondering when he will be able to win against her again. But she refuses, telling him that she is busy and that he can ask God when he will win. It is then that Oculus reveals how God is long gone. In the bar, the man is escalating the situation, but Desim is quick to subdue him with his strings. With his focus turned towards the man, the assistant runs over to the boy to check on him, but at that moment the boy suddenly puts her to sleep, revealing his true identity to be Jinti, another one of the Arbiters. He wonders why Desim is unable to pass judgment on that human for so long. Desim explains that she is a unique case, as she was already aware that she died so he was unable to prompt her to play any games. Thus none of her memories have returned to her, and for the time being he has her assisting him with his work, explaining that her fresh opinions are helpful and fascinating. This infuriates Jinti, who thinks of humans as lesser beings, and a battle breaks out. But before it can get too chaotic, Nana arrives and subdues Jinti. She explains that the situation today was Quinn's memory test, which Desim had completely failed. After all one of the souls sent his way was without any memories, and such a situation cannot happen. Nana elaborates how all humans have memories, no matter how hazy or suppressed they are by the trauma of their death. So when one arrives without them, he is not going to be able to pass judgment over them and must cancel the game. Desim apologizes for his failure to perform as expected and promises to do better. Inquiring about the other soul that was sent to the bar, Nana explains how it is only a decoy dummy implanted with fake memories for the purpose of the test. After she leaves, Clavis takes care of the dummy. Before they leave Desim wonders why Jinti wanted to take part in his test. But instead of giving him an answer Jinti just brushes him off, stating how Desim's attitude is pissing him off. As Desim is bringing the assistant back to bed so she can rest, she has the same dream once again. Dreaming of a woman reading a certain bedtime story to her. 
a high school girl arrives at a different bar, this one tended by Jinti. With her is a young man whom she quickly recognizes to be Harada, the lead singer of a boy idol group, Cross Heart Attack. She is elated to see him and quickly introduces herself as Mayu, one of his biggest fans. Jinti gets annoyed by her spunky attitude so he makes them play a game quickly, without even explaining the rules. Mayu is thrilled to play a game with her idol, so she quickly smashes the button and a game is chosen. They end up having to play Twister and it seems to be all fun and games until Mayu asks for a break. It is then that Jinti steps up the game and reveals that they are betting their lives on the outcome. The game intensifies as each move they make makes it harder and harder to stay on the board, with different elements blasting them with all of their might. With the tensions getting higher, their memories start to flood back. Mayu remembers how much of her life revolves around Harada, as she always listens to his music and goes to his concerts. Suddenly Harada makes a move which escalates the game even further, dropping the entire floor except for the parts they are propped up against. Jinti declares that it is now sudden death, and the first person to fall off to their death will lose. Hearing that, Harada decides that he will knock Mayu off to make sure he survives. But before he can do that, Mayu speaks up, telling him how she will give up so he can live. She reveals to him how important he is to her, as his music was able to help her keep going, no matter how difficult her life got. Hearing that, Harada's memories flood back and he remembers how a fan he used to date ended up killing herself when he broke up with her. This makes him remember how he felt when he heard the news and how much he regrets what he had done. When Mayu drops herself off the platform, Harada lunges after her and catches her by the hand. He confesses that he forgot how his fans are the reason he made it this far, so without her support he would not be where he is now. Not wanting to part ways with her like this, he clings onto her hand, but she starts slipping out. Before he loses his grasp on her, he makes her promise that she will come to another one of his concerts. Just as she promises, she slips away and plummets into the depths. While falling, all of her memories return and she remembers how she died by hitting her head while getting into the bath. On the other hand, Harada remembers how he was killed by his current girlfriend, who happened to be the sister of the one that took her own life. And she left a message with a bomb that was set to go off when he gets out of bed. Hitting the bottom of the pitfall, Mayu does not end up getting hurt at all as it is made out of a soft material that cushions her impact. However, as Jinti checks up on her, she yells at him and demands a bath and a change of clothes. It turns out she had peed herself and does not even care about the fact that she is dead. This catches Jinti off guard and he wonders if she is even human. On the other hand, Harada finds a seat by the bar and starts drinking his sorrows away, lamenting over his death and how bad he feels for the girl that killed herself. But his sadness is quickly wiped away the moment he lays his eyes on Mayu, who is now donning a traditional yukata and has freshened herself up after taking a bath. He states how this suits her much better than the makeup she was wearing before, and the two of them start acting all cheerful in front of Jinti, which pisses him off even more. In the end he allows them to hang out for a while longer, in order for Harada to hold one last concert for Mayu. Calvis, Desim and the assistant also join in, and everyone has a great time, except for Jinti who is annoyed by the entire situation. Finding a children's storybook in her room, the assistant ends up remembering parts of her childhood, which makes her realize that she is in fact a dead person. She asks Desim about the book, but he has no knowledge of it, stating how it is possible that Quinn left it, as she is the previous owner of Quinn Desim. Seeing that the assistant is curious, he tells her all about how he inherited this place at the same time as Jinti did his. The two of them had their final trial together, and they watched Quinn perform judgment over two souls. To prove they were ready, they were both given devices which trigger a crisis during the game. While Jinti did as accepted and proved himself a capable arbiter, Desim did not press his button. When Nana questioned him about it, he stated that he simply forgot because he was too distracted by trying to read and understand the thoughts of the two humans. Jinti found Desim's reasoning to be wrong, but Nana did not get upset at him. If anything she seemed to be curious to see how he performs on his own. But she still reminded him how important it is to force the darkness out of their hearts so they can judge them properly. Quinn's advice for Desim was that he finds something he truly treasures, as that will help him hang in there as he performs his never-ending duty. The assistant wonders what it is that he treasures, so he brings her to the back room and shows her his collection of dummy dolls. Meanwhile Nana and Quinn are enjoying some free time together. Nana mentions how Desim still makes mistakes every now and then, but she still prefers him over Jinti. Quinn reassures her that Desim will become an amazing arbiter one day, 
However, she warns Nana to be careful, as implanting human emotions into an arbiter is against the rules. Desim explains to the assistant that he truly respects humans who have lived fulfilled lives, but at the point they get here they are just souls stuffed into dummies. In addition to that, arbiters are set to forget all of the memories shown to them after a while, to make sure they do not get in the way of their duty. Usually those dummies get disposed of after the judgment is completed, but he collects all of the dummies and props them up around the bar making them resemble the souls which they hosted. That way the memories of those who have once lived full lives are preserved here, at least in one form. Jinti has found himself unable to decide where to send Mayu, as her character is nothing like he ever saw before. It is a first time for him to be unable to pass judgment over someone, and it is driving him insane. Nana ponders with Quinn on the viability of their current judgment system, as all of them are dummies that have never experienced what it means to live as humans do, yet they are forced to keep judging them. That is why she wishes to see an arbiter who has the capacity to feel human emotions, and see what kind of judgments they would pass. The next pair of souls that are sent to Quindesim are different than the ones thus far, as there is a murderer among them. Desim calls up Nana to notify her that he does not have any experience with murderers, but she reassures him that he can do it. The assistant overhears what Desim is saying on the phone, so she wonders which one of them is the murderer. But before Desim can answer, the two guests arrive at the bar. After Desim tells them the usual rules, the two men start looking for an exit. It is during that time that the younger man finds a bloodied knife hidden in his back. Not remembering how it got there scares him, so he makes sure to hide it from everyone. In order to get to know the other man better, the younger one introduces himself as Shimada, and learns that the older man is Tatsumi, a detective. Seeing that there is no way out of their predicament, Tatsumi convinces Shimada to go along with the game and see if they can improve their situation over time. Shimada agrees and they get to play a game of air hockey. As the game progresses their memories start coming back. Shimada remembers how he has a younger sister and he had to take care of her on his own, as their parents died when they were still young. But when Tatsumi's memories start coming back, his mood immediately changes, as he remembers that his wife was killed by a criminal who he himself put behind bars. He takes a moment to gather his thoughts, and Desim comments to the assistant how their pace is slower than expected, reasoning that the trauma of their death must have buried their memories quite deep. Hearing that, the assistant requests to see their memories just like he does. Seeing no reason to refuse her, Desim tells her he will send a request for her in a bit. Stealing himself, Tatsumi returns to the game and the two resume playing once again. With an unexpected ferocity he scores points against Shimada, which triggers another memory for him. This time he remembers how he found his sister one evening after she got assaulted by someone. Desim steps up and declares that the game has reached its time limit, so he will increase the stakes, making them feel pain when points are scored against them. Tatsumi apologizes to Shimada, telling him how he will not be going easy on him, as he has something he must do. But Shimada does not back down either, explaining how his sister got assaulted, so he has to leave in order to find that stalker and pay him back. Hearing that, Tatsumi tells him about his wife, declaring how he will go hunt down the criminal who killed her as soon as he is out of here. At that moment the memories that were sent to Desim also arrive to the assistant, and she learns that both of them are in fact killers. Hearing Tatsumi's words shocks Shimada, and he starts losing his nerve. But surprisingly Tatsumi encourages him, telling him how there are people who are worse than trash, and everyone is better off if they are dead, so what he is planning to do is not wrong. They play on and more memories return to Shimada, revealing that he did in fact find that stalker already. And when he assaulted him with his knife, he got stabbed as well. He reveals the knife and the fact that he killed his target already to Tatsumi, but adds that there is another person. As his sister told him there were two, one who assaulted her and one who just watched from the sidelines. Meanwhile the assistant is having a hard time accepting what is going on, objecting that this is not the way to do things and to judge people. Tatsumi gets more of his memories back as well, and he remembers that he also already killed his target. And when he killed him, he heard the grateful voice of his wife, which encouraged him to keep going. Shimada gets cold feet and wants to forfeit the game, but Tatsumi does not want to hear it, motivating him to keep giving it his all so he can leave and finish his mission. Tatsumi's words stir more memories of his sister and Shimada and he plays the game of his life, managing to beat Tatsumi in the end. Just as he is defeated, Tatsumi remembers everything, learning that he was in fact fatally stabbed. To make sure, he asks Desim if Shimada's knife is what killed him, and Desim quickly confirms, revealing that they are already dead and are here to have their souls judged. His words trigger the memories to resurface in Shimada as well, and he remembers how he assaulted the second person. 
who entered the stalker's apartment from behind, killing him in the process before dying from the wound that was inflicted to him by the stalker. The second person happened to Tatsumi, who came there to kill the stalker as well. But Tatsumi is not upset at how things turned out, instead he congratulates Shimada on getting his revenge. At first Shimada is confused, but then he figures out that Tatsumi was the second person involved in the assault. Tatsumi confirms it, stating how he had to make sure there was a victim in order for him to bring justice to the stalker. Shimada cannot accept that and lashes out at Tatsumi, blaming him for not taking action when he could have saved his sister. His words do not phase the cold detective, and he dismisses Shimada, telling him how the stalker would have just gone after someone else. Seeing how things are developing, the assistant tells Desim to stop it, but he refuses, as he has yet to draw out the darkness in Shimada. In order to do so, he gives Shimada a chance to inflict excruciating pain upon Tatsumi, since he cannot kill an already dead person. The assistant cannot bear to watch this any longer and stands against Desim, telling him how what he is doing is not judgment. Emotions that people feel are not that easy to understand and categorize, as everyone feels different, so there is no way he, who has never experienced any of that, is able to understand and judge them. Her words resonate with Desim, and he starts questioning what he is doing. But before anything else happens, Tatsumi ruins the situation by stating how grateful he is to have been a detective, as it has allowed him to bring judgment to so many trash human beings. His self-righteous words egg on Shimada and he moves to inflict pain upon the detective, but the assistant stops him, revealing everything about the Tribunal of Souls and how he is being judged right now, making sure he knows he can get reincarnated and maybe even see his sister again in some other form if he does not get tossed into the void. At first it seems to work, but Tatsumi's continued speech pushes Shimada over the edge and he lets darkness consume him, inflicting excruciating pain upon the detective. In the end both souls are sent into the void, while the assistant is furious with Desim for the way he handles people, explaining how easy it is for them to be affected by things and fall into darkness. Reflecting upon the assistant's words, Desim visits Nane, stating how he believes that the way they judge souls is wrong speculating that their way does not draw out darkness, but instead serves to create darkness in their souls. As someone who respects human lives, he can no longer bring himself to judge them and wishes to resign from his position as an arbiter. Hearing that, Nana wonders what they will do about the assistant, as her time is running out and she must be judged soon. She even offers to be the one to pass judgment over her, but Desim declines. After all, he wants to be the one to see her tribunal to the end, and he does not believe that she has darkness within her soul. Nana warns him that when he finds out what lies inside of her, he might not be able to understand it. In order to help him with the tribunal, Nana decides to send an easy-to-handle soul his way. Back at Quindesim, Desim fetches the assistant, telling her that human souls cannot stay here much longer, so he needs to begin judging now. She goes along with him, and they find out that the other soul Nana sent their way is a kind, elderly lady. She does not ask many questions and they are quick to skip to the game. The roulette picks a card game, Old Maid, to be the game of their tribunal. Since the game is better with more players, Desim joins in as well. As they start playing, the old lady realizes that the cards have special drawings on them, many of which depict things from her life. This reminds her to introduce herself, telling them that her name is Sachiko and she is an illustrator. Some cards depict things relevant to Desim, and as they play he remembers one of his talks with Jinti, where he wondered what the purpose of judging is. This question infuriated Jinti, and he explained that there is no purpose behind it. It is simple, they are arbiters, so they judge, and that is all there is to it. Questioning existence is more fitting for humans, as it is them who wonder what meaning there is in their lives, when in truth there is none. They are born only to die, and that is why he looks down upon them as lesser beings. Desim did not agree with that reasoning but did not voice any complaints against what Jinti said either. Meanwhile Nana visits Quinn together with Clavis, revealing to them that Desim has doubts about judging. In order to help him out, she wants to find and restore all of the memories that the assistant had when she died, instead using just the bits deemed important. That is a lot of work so Quinn is reluctant at first, but Nana quickly convinces her by giving her some alcohol from the human world. The card game is coming along nicely and Sachiko is first to finish. She immediately realizes that she is dead, despite having no memory of her death, explaining how the illustration on one of the cards is something she did not yet create, but only had planned to in the future. Desim decides to drop the pretense and tells her that she is correct. He offers to reveal how she died, but Sachiko declines, telling him that there is no need for that. After all she has lived a full life, and this little game was like a wonderful dream to her. 
pleasantly surprised with her words, Decim continues the game between him and the assistant, who has yet to get any memories back. But when Sachiko sees one of the illustrations on the cards, she recognizes them to be from a children's storybook, Chabot, the same one the assistant kept dreaming about. Sachiko tells them how it is a wonderful story, posing the question how to express love to someone who is deaf, as the protagonist falls in love with a deaf girl in that story, concluding that there are more universal ways to show how someone is feeling, like smiling or crying which surpass all language barriers. Hearing that makes the assistant remember one of her childhood memories, where her mother was chatting with her and reading her this same story. It is from that memory that she remembers her name, Chiyuki. The game comes to an end, but Chiyuki does not remember anything else. After they see Sachiko off and send her to be reincarnated, Decim declares how this way of doing things really will not work with her. Meanwhile Oculus summons Clavis and uses his power to go through his memories, as he is suspicious of Nana doing something behind his back. Thanks to that he finds out about Decim, an arbiter with the potential to feel human emotions, and he is less than pleased with that information. Back at Quindecim, Decim tells Chiyuki that he believes there is a point to living and that humans justify their existence by the way they live their lives. As such, judgment over them must be passed hand in hand with humans and human emotions. Jinti has had enough with being unable to pass judgment over Mayu, so he presents a new choice to her. He tells her how the void is a horrible place, with nothing but eternal darkness and negative emotions, which all souls that are damned to end up there must face for all eternity. In order to bring back Harada from the void, he needs another soul to take his place, so he offers her the choice to sacrifice a total stranger to save her favorite idol. Although she feels very strongly about Harada, she is reluctant to doom a total stranger. Back in Quindesim, Desim has prepared the stage for Chiyuki to regain her memories. In order to do so, he had her change into ice skating attire and create an ice skating arena. Seeing that makes Desim remember how he first met Chiyuki. From the start she knew that she was dead, but she had no idea how she died, so she broke down into tears while asking him to tell her how it happened. Not knowing what he should do, Desim asked Nana and Clavis for help once she tired herself out and fell asleep. Nana quickly stated that her memories will be wiped again and judgment will be started over with another arbiter, but Desim requested that he will be the one to conduct it again. Hearing him speak up about that made Nana curious, so she allowed it. Once Chiyuki starts to skate on the ice, Desim helps set the scene by having one of the dummies play the piano for her, while many other dummies start applauding. This proves to work and Chiyuki starts remembering her entire childhood, the time she spent with her parents and how she got into ice skating. She quickly became really good at it and joined competitions, which she won one after the other. Everything in her life revolved around ice skating, and she had a promising future in the art. But one day she suffered a terrible injury while performing. It was so bad that the doctor told her she will never be able to skate again. This devastated her to such a degree that she fell into heavy depression. It is not that she was sad about not being able to skate any longer, but more so that all of her friends and family suddenly felt so distant to her, almost like strangers. Since none of them were her, she believed that none of them understand how she feels, and she could not understand how they felt either. In the end she felt completely empty and begun hating herself to the degree that she could not bear it any longer, and took her own life. She retells the entire story to Desim, stating how people just do not know how others feel, and it is wrong to try and do so. Desim listens to her story patiently before speaking up. He questions if it is really wrong for him to try and understand how others feel. After all he has never experienced life, let alone death, so he wishes to know more about the feelings that humans go through, and he would like to learn more about her as well. Because meeting her has spurred that desire within him, he tells just how glad he is that he met her. Going back to the bar, he pours the final drink they will share, but as soon as Chiyuki takes a sip, she falls asleep. Meanwhile Jinti takes Mayu to the elevator with a soulless dummy of Harada's body, promising that he will wake up once they reach the destination as it is the place where his soul now resides. Before he sends her off, he questions what purpose her life had as she seems to be more interested in saving Harada than herself. Mayu tells him that she is aware that not many people would be proud of the life she led, but that her dedicating it towards Harada gave it meaning in itself, and that is good enough for her. In the end she pities Jinti as he believes that his life has no meaning behind it, just the duty of an arbiter. She is sent plummeting towards the void. Once she gets close to the destination, Harada's soul gets back into the dummy, making him wake up for a single moment before both of their souls are stripped from the dummies and sent into the void. However, even in the void their souls stay together as one. Quinn gets a call from Desim, 
requesting that she sends all of Chiyuki's memories to him. She was already expecting it, as those are the memories Nana had her prepare in advance. So she quickly notifies Nana that it is beginning. Nana tries to go and witness it firsthand, but she is intercepted by Oculus. Oculus reveals that he found out about her secret plan, and tries to stop her with his power. But she avoids him and rebukes that the current system is flawed, insisting that they are not just dummies and they need to change how they do things. Oculus quickly reminds her that they are all, in fact, dummies made out of souls that are cast into the void. When she protests, he simply lets her go, telling her that she will see it herself soon enough. Desim takes Chiyuki to a special floor with the elevator, and once she regains her senses she is back in her home. Desim joins her as she walks through the house, remembering random things that happened in the past. Once she spots a small shrine dedicated to her, the reality of her death sinks in. Suddenly, her mother walks into the house and addresses the shrine talking to Chiyuki for a bit before returning to her chores. But she can neither see nor hear Chiyuki as well as Desim. Desim hands Chiyuki the same device he used before to create a crisis situation and bring out the darkness and souls. He explains that if she presses the button this time, she will be brought back to life in place of a random living person, adding that over 7,000 people pass away every single hour, so it would not impact anything on the grand scale. But the time is running out and she needs to make a decision. Memories of her death will be erased and she will be able to return as if nothing had happened. As she is pondering what to do, Chiyuki sees her mother bring an offering to her shrine, apologizing for not being able to tell how she felt back then. She starts crying, yelling how much she misses her and feels like a failure of a mother. This is too much for Chiyuki to bear and she breaks down, declaring how much she wants to live and talk with her mother again. To be able to spend time with her once again, there is no other way. Chiyuki holds the device in her hand and is about to push the button. But then she remembers all those who had died and came to Quindesim. She remembers how important life was to them and realizes that she cannot push that button. After all, she would be taking away one such life. Dropping the remote, she tells Desim that she cannot do it because everyone has feelings for someone. Desim reminds her that they have nothing to do with her. But she explains that there is someone like her mother out there for everyone, someone who cherishes them and will be devastated if they die. Even so she wants to be with her mother once again, but she cannot bring herself to take another life in exchange for it. Instead she breaks into tears and starts apologizing to her mother for not realizing how she felt and not valuing her life enough. The weight of her grief awakens emotions within Desim, and once she begs of him to push the button in her stead, he can bear it no longer. With tears running down his face he apologizes and the illusion breaks apart, revealing that it was all a lie. He keeps apologizing, as he finally realizes how much pain he subjected her to, revealing that he just wanted to get to know her better, and that was the only way for him, as he is an arbiter. Seeing him broken up like that, Chiyuki wastes no time to pull him into a hug. She tells him that there is no need to apologize anymore, as she can understand how he feels now. Oculus and Nana are shocked with what they see, and Oculus wonders just what Nana did to Desim to make him that way. Nana explains how she had him work side by side with a human for a while. Hearing that, Oculus is quick to remind her that getting arbiters close to humans only makes judgment more difficult, as well as making them suffer needlessly. However, Nana tells him that it is natural for suffering to be a part of judgment, as otherwise there is no point to it. After all to suffer, yet stand firm, is what it means to live. Noticing that she talks a lot about meaning and life, Oculus reminds her once more that they are all dummies who can never live nor die. But she refutes that, telling him that he is wrong, and that they live in the present. After both Desim and Chiyuki have calmed down, they head back towards Quindesim. Desim tells her that the place they were at is the disposal area for dummies once their souls leave them. But she will not be thrown away here. She thanks him for that and they return to the bar. After saying their final farewells, Desim declares how he aspires to be an arbiter whose guests can say that they enjoyed living after coming here. Chiyuki smiles and tells him that smiling more will help him with achieving that. Before the doors of the elevator close and she is sent for reincarnation, she can see Desim pull off a genuine, warm smile for the first time ever, and it brings tears to her eyes. This entire situation has caused Oculus to add another rule to the list for Arbiters to follow, namely one forbidding them from working hand in hand with life, as doing so will surely ruin them. Time goes on and another pair of souls finds their way to Quindesim. They are greeted by the bartender, Desim, who welcomes the new guests with a warm smile. Next to him sits Chiyuki's dummy, which brandishes a beautiful smile as well. 